Hello, good morning, and this is again another video lesson as a continuation of chapter 6, again for communication for various purposes. I already made this video lesson in the event that I may not be able to meet you due to some circumstances or internet connection problems. And right now, I am also experiencing some internet connection problems, which is why it will be best for us to make this video lesson. Now, as a continuation from the first function, we now proceed to the second function as stated here and given on our screen. The second function is to persuade, wherein we define persuasion as the process of creating, reinforcing, or changing people's beliefs or actions. When we try to persuade a person, we usually look into the way that people or that person will understand what we are saying. From a small belief or a small idea, which then becomes a bigger idea because of persuasion or the moment you have persuaded the person. Which of course is very important, especially if you want a person to believe what you think is right or probably persuading him to buy this item, especially in marketing or any other concept that is possible. Now, there's a difference between informative and persuasive speech. Informative speakers fulfill the role of an expert on a topic and seek to facilitate audience understanding about it. And, in contrast, of persuasive speakers take the role of promoter or proponent, advocating a particular view on a topic they want the audience to adopt. Both of them are giving information, that's right. An informative speaker, your only intention is just to inform your audience about a concept or an idea that you know. Or probably you are giving a lecture about it. But on the other hand, besides giving a lecture, besides giving information about it, you also want them to take the concept that you're giving, thinking and believing that what you've given is right. So that again is on the difference. Now, there are elements of persuasion that you have to remember. The first one, and we have ethos. This is the Greek word for character. Here, the speaker attempts to persuade others by using authoritative and trustworthy force or support of the message. Say, for example, as a mother of healthy eaters, I can assure you that introducing vegetables to babies as early as possible avoids fussy feedings. Now, by this case, the authority of the mother is being shown here and because that authority is also believable or can be believed by those listeners, therefore, they're now thinking that it's a persuasive element that can help, again, the audience to uh, probably buy the item or the product or any other thing. So again, you persuade them through character. You show character, you show authority. That's what you need, methods. Next, we have pathos. This refers to the speaker's appeal to emotions. A speaker might use pathos to arouse the audience's feeling, such as by displaying photos to convince them to contribute to charitable organizations. And by just the idea of photos, by just looking on those memories, you would say that it is really a great feeling to be part of that group, which is why through those emotions that were surrounding you, you then later on submit to those emotions and again be persuaded. Another example, imagine your children facing a future without you. Then, take the opportunity today to give up drugs and create a healthier you. Well, of course, in giving speeches, words are words, they're already good. 
but it also depends on how you say it. Which is why, if you're going to say this one more time, say for example, you really want to persuade a person. Imagine, your children facing a future without you. Then, take the opportunity today to give up drugs and create a healthier you. Isn't that wonderful? And isn't that persuasive? Right? So that's again on to the usage of the emotions of your audience or listeners. And finally, we have logos. The logos. This involves using logic to support a speaker's stand or a speaker's statements and thereby persuading his audience. Now, one way class of doing this is by developing a coherent space that moves logically through his argument, emphasizing reasoning, then moving into a powerful conclusion. This now class, through the usage of logic, through the usage of connecting ideas and information, will surely help and help you as the speaker to fully persuade your audience by presenting them facts, by presenting them the correct information. You are surely to persuade them in such a way that they're also delivering it in a persuasive manner. So again, we have ethos, we have pathos, and we have logos. Those three again are very much connected with each other in order for you to deliver a persuasive speech. Now, there are different persuasive speeches class. The first one is we have speeches on question of fact. A question of fact asks whether something is true or false. The speaker tries to persuade an audience that something did or did not occur, or that event did, in fact, cause another. So, when you are to question a fact and again, to make them think if it's true or false and then later on, they try to, again, as mentioned here, to persuade an audience that something did or did not occur. And again, you are persuading them in the event or about an event, right? So that again, speeches on question of fact, you let them question it and then later on, you let them believe it through the evidences or the supports you are giving. Next, we have speeches on question of value. The question of value asks for a subjective evaluation of something's worth, significance, quality, or condition. Here, the speaker argues that something is good or bad, right or wrong, beautiful or ugly, boring or engaging. It now focuses on the subjective aspect of the idea, or the concept that you are wanting them to believe, right? And again, it appeals more into the subjective value of the item, again, as mentioned. And of course, since we as persons are pretty much easy to understand whether something is beautiful or ugly, by just looking on the value, we think that is already um, a thing that we should believe it. Next, we have the speeches on question of policy. While the question of value makes judgments about the topic and promotes the speaker's judgments of the significance of something, a question of policy as what specific course of action should be taken or how a problem should be solved. Now, in this case, you're now wanting them to question about the rules, about the judgments, again, that they're making on uh, an item, a concept, or again, what specific action, as mentioned here, should be taken. If this is about a problem that you want to be solved, and you're giving out a solution on your speech, and this is the right kind of speech. Or, if people are very much confused on what to do about a specific issue, then again, this is the speech for you. And finally, we now arrive to the third function of communication. The 
again, we started with the first function, which is to inform. The second function is to persuade. And finally, we have number three, which is purpose or to entertain rather. Now, on entertaining honor or praise, we start with the purpose. Now, the primary purpose of informative speech is to teach, while that of persuasive speech is to change behaviors or beliefs. While under this one class, it is already mentioned as of to entertain or to make people look into the comedic side or to honor a person or to give appreciation and somehow to validate the good things and finally get to praise, right? Now, these purposes are just secondary of a special occasion presentation whose primary purpose is to perform a ritual. Now, say for example, a ceremonial act that is characterized by qualities or procedures that are appropriate to the occasion. What is good on number three or the third function is that it can also get and take the first and the second function along with it. Right? When you're entertaining, you're also giving information. And while you're also entertaining them, you're also wanting them to believe what you're giving. Therefore, siding with informative and persuasive piece, uh, function. Right? So that's the beauty and the greatness of the third function. Now, before we continue to this one, it also takes practice in order for us to fully understand and use the third function. It doesn't just um, get to be learned in just one day. It takes time for us to master this if ever we really want to, right? And especially those people who are working on comedy covers, again, they took years time of practice for them. Now, number two is style. While informative and persuasive speeches use stylistic devices like narratives, metaphors, similes, or analogies, special occasion speeches use highly stylistic or ornamental language. Right? So if from before, it's more of literary devices, is what we can see here, right? Metaphors, similes, we've known all that happened. This time, it's more of becoming more effective and at the same time we use language uh, words or words in a language which can be entertaining as well because we wouldn't want to give an entertaining speech but the words might not be of context right number three organization so special occasion presentations like any other speeches have introduction body and conclusion they have less obvious transitions between the main points instead their ornamental styling may suggest more subtle and creative ways and they are relatively short in entertaining speeches class or in entertaining speeches you really don't need to make it that long in order for you to impress people again it doesn't always lie on the length of your speech it's about the content that you will be giving throughout your entire speech or discussion. Formality? Well, they are a bit formal, but formality refers more to the degree of professionalism used by the speaker to share his ideas with his listeners. Well, you really don't need to become very formal like you're addressing a lot of scholars here because if you want to entertain, right? You need to become a bit formal, but at the same time, more into the casual side. The more of a, um, let's say, a speaker who is focused on appealing to the emotions of the audience while making them laugh, appreciating things, and again, looking more into the bright side. Okay? Now, there are general types of special occasion speeches. The first one is courtes courtesy speeches or courtesy. Now, speech at introduction will be the first one. The speech is designed to tell us about the person being introduced and help establish his ethos. 
in this case, EFAS might include credentials and or goodwill. And again, you remember that ethos is about the character of the person. So, by introducing it, so at the same time, it's also a manner of giving honor to the person, right? Now, it is also heard or usually heard when every time we are to introduce a resource speaker, especially in webinars. Now, I want you not to use the following approaches when we're making speech of introduction or speeches of introduction. The first one is introduction, use an anecdote or some story to establish the speaker being introduced. You may even take quotations in order for it to become more powerful. Next would be the body. Discuss his biography and qualifications. Focus on qualification most relevant to the occasion. And finally, we have the conclusion. Summarize his qualifications and use that summary to explain why he was asked to speak. Now, of course, why is it that you've invited the person? What is it in the person that you want him to speak right in front of many people? So that's what you're going to show in the speech of introduction class. Make sure that the audience will also be persuaded to believe into this person that this is the right person for the job. Next, we have the speech of presentation. The speech is used when a person is publicly presented with a gift or an award. It is usually brief and the length depends on the formality of the occasion. Now this usually goes when we are now giving the award or the certificate or of recognition to the person after the webinar or after the talk. Now, state the person's name early in the presentation, explain the award's significance, why again are you awarding the person, explain how the person is selected for the award, highlight what makes this person unique, and hand the award to the recipient again is of course the best double gesture for this. Again, make sure to explain to your audience why again are you awarding this person, what is special about it. Those are the guide questions that you can use for this. Next would be the speech of acceptance. The speech is delivered by individuals who have been recognized, honored, or awarded. Now, we also have guidelines for the awardee as to the one who will be receiving the award. Be thankful and humble. Be succinct. Keep his remarks brief because you really don't need to make it that long since you might not just be the only person who will be receiving the award. And at the same time, again, always be humble after this. And contextualize the award. Describe what he did or what you did that led to the award. You can also talk about an inspirational short message as to how you have garnered or have taken that award. And wouldn't be that wonderful if you also inspired those listeners to also grab that kind of award, right? Now, there are also ceremonial speeches. The first would be the commencement address, or also known as the graduation speech. And later on, it would be very nice for us to see you also giving this kind of address. The speaker both acknowledges the importance of this ceremony and honors the graduates. Later on, you will be given an opportunity as well to give speeches to different people. And a good speech that you can give is again a commencement address wherein we are able to inspire those who are, are who have just graduated. Okay? Next would be a commemorative speech, a speech of praise or celebration. So it can be tributes, dedications, or even eulogies, or the speech that we give when a person we love has passed away. So the speech aims to pay tribute to a person, a group of people, and an institution or an institution. From the word commemorate, it's really important that we again pay tribute to the ones that have gone for us, gone ahead for us. Next would be the contest speeches, original oratory, 
So in this speech, the speaker is allowed to choose his topic and write his own speech about it. Of course, if the topic is given unto you, especially in impromptu speeches in the public, this again is included and as part of the contest speeches for you to deliver your own thoughts. Okay? And of course, also have extemporaneous speaking. Participants are required to choose from given topics and prepare a 5 to 7 minute speech on the topic. And usually, this can even go with or without an outline at all. Well, of course, it's the outline that is already put in our mind. But usually, other people can even go about speaking without preparing anything. And they just are able to organize what they are saying through speaking slowly. You might be asking, how is it that people or there are some people who can keep on speaking in straight English without stop, without any pauses, or in such a case, still understandable even if there are pauses. Well, the answer lies on the tempo of your speech. If you keep on speaking too fast, then of course, you would also get tense. You don't have much time to think carefully, which is why the tempo is also important. So try practicing that as well, class. We also have the dramatic and humorous interpretation. Participants are allowed to choose the materials they want to perform. It may be done separately or combined, right? And this again has been very common in your classes from before, especially if, again, you are wanting to make a humorous presentation about a speech even if there's just someone who is speaking, you would also want an interpretation where the audience can also be amused, okay? Now, there are also types of speeches class based on delivery. So, as mentioned earlier, we have impromptu speech, on-the-spot speech, by just giving a question or, should I say, the questions given to uh, the pageants, if I got that right, because once they ask a question, usually the contestants are obliged to answer immediately after the question. So that's an impromptu speech. Or probably when you are asked to recite during class, which can also be an impromptu speech, especially if you really know about that topic and again you were asked to just make an on-the-spot speech, then again, this is the speech for you. Next would be an extemporary speech, a carefully planned and rehearsed speech. But again, the rehearsal of this extemporary speech is also not that long. Again, five to seven minutes are only given for the preparation of the speech. Next, we have the manuscript speech, where the speech is read in its entirely entirety, sorry, when delivered. Say, for example, political speeches, ceremonial speeches, radio, and television speeches. And again, this is very common right now, especially when we are giving messages in events. And finally, we have memorized speech, a speech that the speaker delivers by rote, or should I say, a direction that you have already prepared because at the back of your mind, if you are able to memorize that speech, then it can also give you a more clear um, explanation. However, this is not the case always because there are also other people who would prefer to not make any outlines or not to memorize the speeches that they're giving because they believe that it will be much more open if they just think of ideas at the moment. Just like what we're doing right now. Okay? And that would be the end of the presentation. And I hope again you have enjoyed our discussion for today. And just wait for the activity that will be posted on our class games. 
again. Thank you so much and have a great day. This is again communication for various purposes.